This morning, I want to begin from Kolebu Teaching Hospital and reiterate a point that I'd raised many, 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 many weeks ago. The fact that Kolebu Teaching Hospital still does not have uh, a functional MRI machine, CT scan, and that they've had to resort to private services and patients will have to bear the brunt of that particular uh, service at Ghana's premier, premier, and Ghana's biggest tertiary hospital, Ghana's biggest teaching hospital. That is happening as we speak. And I've, I've, I've had cause to talk about it so many times. I've had cause to talk about the fact that sometimes the lift at Kolebu doesn't work and patients will have to be carried. Uh, their uh, relatives will have to pay monies for them to be taking, you know, people carry them literally uh, over the staircase. And I've, I've had cause to complain about it so many times. Like, why does Kolebu as big as it is, not have a CT scan machine. Why should they uh, be making MRI referrals to private people to go and, and do that? And I, I find that very, very bizarre. I've also told you in the past how there's a conflict of interest because the boss at Kolibu is also the, the man in charge of the plastic surgery department. And yesterday, I read a petition that as, as six unions in, at Kolibu had signed, including senior staff, including the pharmacist, etc. They were asking that their contract should not be renewed because when the boss is not there, all things come to a standstill. Nobody is able to sign uh, checks, everything, consumables, everything else. I told you about that. I'd also told you about a situation in Kolibu where somebody had been given a post-retirement contract contrary to what we had been promised and told that we will not do that again in this country because of where we find ourselves. And that post-retirement contract had an element in it or a clause in it that suggested or said that whoever was getting, that's Mr. Denchi, was getting a contract extension, should train somebody to take over because after that contractual extension, there would not be another extension. That contract extension ended in May or so. We are in August, and Kolebu Teaching Hospital has not been able to tell us whether Mr. Denchi trained somebody or not, and why there's the intention to want to give Mr. Denchi another contract extension. While there are younger people who are also looking for opportunities, and did Mr. Denchi, for example, have deputies? We've spoken about that. We've, and, and it hurts me because when a hospital like Kolebu, when uh, state universities, when the institutions that are supposed to be the standard are now trying to, you know, turn things upside down. It hurts me. Yesterday I read also for you something from the University of Cape Coast. The registrar who has gone on retirement, right? The registrar who has gone on retirement is also the secretary to the council. He had written a post-retirement uh, letter to himself. GTEC says, no, no, no. That's not what the law says. That's not the position of the law. And it's becoming disturbing that the UCC would do a thing like that. So they should reverse the trend. I mean, how do you expect to have quality and excellence when those who are supposed to be giving you excellence are actually trying to mimic the wrong and institutionalize the wrong that we all frown upon? How do you get a country working like that? So, for example, there's a, they put a, the, the recruitment things up for me. There is a talk about recruitment into the security services. Professor Vladimir Nchidansa says we should only get qualified people in there. There have also been the talk about the tribal uh, sentiments that have been expressed. There's also the family and friends cronyism, and then master say make, uh, make, make we recruit you kind of thing that's going on there. Now, I find one thing strange about it. Recruitment to the Ghana Prison Service for 2024. Recruitment to the Ghana Police Service for 2024. Recruitment into the Fire Service for 2024. And it says that they are all asking for those who applied in 2021. This exercise is for those who applied in 2021. So I, as I ask a very simple question. The question I ask is, it, those who applied in 2021, Let's say the cutoff age, right? And not say, but the cutoff age is at like 28. In fact, this one says 21, must a minimum of 21 and no more than 35 years. That's for the Ghana Prison Service. Let's go to the police service. They also have their age requirement. So does age not matter anymore? Because if I applied in 2021, and let's say I'm 32, and I applied in 2021, Johnny by 2024, Christ. I will no longer be 32. Right? I will no longer be 32. 
And if I'm no longer 32 years old, how do you expect that those who have now attained the age bracket that are supposed to be in there and supposed to be recruited, what happens to them? So are we now going to rec recruit people who are older than um, the age that we publish and which we use to disqualify other people in the past? Are we being fair? I've said here that other countries actually go around, um, what do you call it, pubs and eateries, begging people to join their security services. Here, we take money from the people, we put them on the sun, we literally humiliate them. When we finish, we ask them to go home. How did we come to a standby list? Because within the period, accusations and counter-accusations have been made about recruitments that have been, have been done. The interior minister threatened that he was going to give us the list of uh, members of the minority that had brought a list for people to be recruited. We are still waiting for that list after he blew that hot air. The, the, no, the current interior minister, Henry Quarty, was he not the one who said that in parliament? So we are waiting for that list. I have had cause to show you videos here of recruitments that are ongoing, even without the publication of the, these notices in the dailies. So these publications are just to take a certain box to assure you that everything is okay. Who are we recruiting into our security services? And are they qualified in the first place by the age, by their educational qualification, by their health status? These are, these are requirements and prerequisites that people were disqualified based upon those, those, uh, those metrics. So within the last um, three years, age doesn't matter anymore. Are we trying to clog the public, uh, what do you call it, recurrent expenditure with this? How many more do we need? Because the argument has been that oh, when we came, there was only four, there were only four thousand or so immigration officers. Now we have fifteen thousand. If you have fifteen thousand, what is the distribution? How has it helped, for example, in people coming into the country illegally? There's arrest in Nigeria, and somebody tells me around the border that they see number plates, Nigerian number plates coming in. Wah wah. The 15,000 that we have now, how are they helping to police what we have there? So that that influx and then the, the attendant effect is not too heavy on us because already we are suffering as a country. These are simple questions that require answers. Where from this concept of standby list and backlog? Where from it? How did we come to the point where we have a standby list and backlog, even for security people? Are we not going to do a security scan of all of them again, all over again, spend resources all over again before we, we take them to the training schools? We have no longer, no longer, no, we no longer have regard for, for age, which is a primary requirement for recruitment into these security services. Are we trying to get money from the people again? I told you that in this country, we made 84,000 young people queue at the uh, Elwak Sports Stadium. 84,000 young people, they queued at the Elwak Sports Stadium. Each one of them paid 100 Ghana cities. We only picked 500 people out of them. 84,000. And I remember in opposition, my brother Samir Uku said, recruitment into these services will be free of charge. He said it, the tape is there. You doubt me, I'll play it for you. So how, how has the situation changed? How has it changed? Let's do a bit of throwback. Now a few tweets. Let's, let's, let's do the throwbacks. We will see exactly what transpired in the past. And while we find the tweets, there's a parliamentary Otabel video there. But before then, the preamble of the Constitution. Let me, let me see that. That preamble talks about the fact that the power resides in the people. The power resides in the people. Power is, is that of the people. It belongs to the people. And maybe you have not, if you listen to that, if you find that mensal tape for me, please play, find it and let's play. It tells you how much power you have as an electorate, as a citizen. 
and how that portion of your sovereignty must be preserved with all the sanctity. That sermon was preached 11 years ago. That sermon is relevant then and is relevant now because the closing thought of that sermon said that the sermon is not just about the 2012 election, but it is about the elections that will come thereafter. It is not just about the 2012 elections. It's about the elections that will come thereafter. Play an Akubia's video for me, please. John is right. Who are the insurers of your fleet? Um, enterprise insurance. Enterprise insurance? Yeah. Why enterprise insurance and not SIC? Is government refusing to do business with government? No. Okay. Um, enterprise insurance. Enterprise insurance came with the bank. Mm. The bank came with, or enterprise came with the bank. They, they came together. So if you went to ADB as we speak, mm. if your company, I don't know the name of your company, is it Media General? Media General, right? If you went to ADB for a facility. Mm -hmm to buy transmitters and get new studios and so on. Right. Your automatic insurance will be enterprise. I see. Yeah. So what happens to I S think the, the, SIC? The, I think that, no. Because uh, in, the, in the past, one was second. it SIC that, that, that secured uh, insured yeah, yeah, your yeah, vehicles? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had, we had SIC. But you, are, you have a choice. I mean, I don't, nobody imposes insurance on you. They are bid, and then you negotiate. And That's what I'm asking you. Is government refusing to do business with government? Well, let me tell you what I know. Tell me, sir. Uh, you asked me why enterprise. Yes, and sir. I've said it came with the bank. Right. That's it. As to, I don't know what government is doing or what government is not doing as, as far as insurance. Because SIC is, is I'm suffering. Talking of, I'm talking SIC of, is really suffering. I'm talking of ADB. Right. We got, I'm saying if you went for a loan Nine, today mm -hmm. from ADB, they'll say it's our money. This is our insurance company. And that's what happened. I see. Mm. So it is not your doing? No. Okay. I asked a very simple question of senior brother Nana Kumia. And that question is still relevant because, you see, I've, I've given you a simple task as a citizen of the Republic. You see a government number plate, the green ones. Just pick up your phone. And dial star 920 star 57 hash. Star 920 star 57 hash. Once you type that, it will take you to the next portal where it will ask you to enter the car number. Just enter the car number without the space. So, for example, it's GV11120. Just enter it all at once. No spacing. And then send. It will tell you whether the car has an active insurance or not and who the insurer is. What has been the practice in the past? And what is the practice now? And I'm not just talking about government vehicles. I'm talking about uh, well, airplanes, the aerodrome. I'm talking about ships. I'm talking about all those other insurance gigs that state insurance companies used to have, which was vibrant, which was the vision of Osajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Today, what has become of it? The state institution is literally on its knees begging for crumbs. Literally on its knees begging for crumbs. And two days ago, I got a distress call from Gayhawk, for example, another state institution, where they were telling me that, oh, they used to have a fund that, you know, they, they, they got soft loans and things from it, uh, sometimes 4% and all of that. People contribute to it. Somebody woke up one day and said, we have cancelled their scheme. So the people who had come to take loans from the scheme at Gayhawk. How are you going to trace them and pay back, get them to pay back? And if they are going to pay back, where are they going to pay? Which fund are they going to pay into? Which account? And those who require some help, how are they going to now get it? Just wake up and take an arbitrary decision, no consultation of the union, no consultation of senior staff association, boom! Cancel it. And this is something that had been there for more than 20 years. You see the, the, the rot happening at PBC? For a full year, they have not been paid. How do their families feed? 
And these are all, I'm just, I'm just trying to let you know how we are trying to run aground state institutions just to make, by all means, let the private sector survive and thrive. Let them, let them succeed and make money. But that should not be at the expense of the state institutions because the state must do business with the state. Nanakumia says, ADB facility came with enterprises. How ADB belongs to us is a state institution. It belongs to us. SIC belongs to us. How is it that, um, what do you call it, uh, ADB is giving uh, a loan to STC to buy buses, and they ignore SIC, and they go and choose a private entity, and they say the money that they are giving is tied to that particular insurance company. So government is not doing business with government. That's the bottom line. Let's see the tweets. We'll, go, we'll do a bit of a throwback. Let's just see the tweets. Johnny's this one is from Senior Kofi Bento, 23rd January 2017, when the government was still fresh. He says, Boache Jaco, you give me hope that Ghana will work again. If a man knows this much about his job before day one, there is hope. I wish we had this eight years ago. Boache Jaco, you give me hope that Ghana will work again. If a man knows his, this much about his job before day one, there is hope. I wish we had this eight years ago. Then Akosia comes to say he can only be refused on the basis that he's never qualified for the job. He's just too much. That was the level of confidence. That was the level of confidence we had in Boache Jaco. He was chased out of that office. Why? He kept quiet. Until the time when he wanted to be flag bearer of the MPP, then he started speaking, but it was too late. Let's see the other tweet. Johnny's bite. There's a tweet from senior Samuel Atabensa, and I have not worked with Samuel before, but people who know him, people who have worked with him, and we can all see what is done with CTFM. He had this to say, 15 November 2018. One thing I can say without any reservation is that Ken Oforiata came into this finance ministry position very prepared in every aspect. The finance minister you will admire secretly, even if you are in opposition. Again, one thing I can say without reservation is that Ken Oforiata came into this finance ministry position very prepared in every aspect. The finance minister will, you will admire secretly, even if you are in opposition. This was Samuel Atamensa. He later joined the government, Coastal Development Authority. He left, obviously, because he was not happy how things were being run there. And still, the situation no really changed. But this was what he said about Mr. Ken Oforiata. Did Ken Oforiata deliver? Right. If you do a, a retrospective, if you have the same views, did Mr. Oforiata deliver? Can this is right. senior Nana Banamwa. She says, it's time we elected MPs who can see through nonsense to make sensible laws. At Kojo Pong Kruma has been seen through nonsense on Jaw FM since 2006. This was when Kojo wanted to go into politics full time and represent the people of Ofwasia Yerubi. He still represents them. Nana Banaba says, it's time we elected MPs who can see through nonsense to make sensible laws. Kong Kruma has been seen through nonsense on Joy FM since 2006. Question, does Kojo Ponkroma still see through nonsense today? Does he still see through nonsense today? Today, he's, still, he's part of the government. He's an integral part of the government on the cabinet table. Does he see through nonsense today? From information deputy to main man to now works and housing, does he see through the nonsense today? The people in the Volta region, through VRA's own doings, spillage, some of them still sleep outside. We are not talking about them. Under his watch, under Senso Bachi's watch, we are talking about how to sell Saglemi, which we made so much noise about. You see the irony? Saglemi is supposed to be a, an affordable housing scheme. And then now, the people were displaced from their own homes because we spilled the dam without really getting a plan B for them. Johnny's right. And then now, we are not talking about them. We are talking about selling the affordable housing, which we so demonized. I thought they said people would go to jail. The, question, the ultimate question is that 
Is Ken Oforiata the minister we still admire even if you were in opposition? Number two, what happened to Boache Jaku? Number three, does Kojo Aponkuma still see through nonsense like he saw when he was on Joy FM? Play me Pastor Mensa Notable's video, please. In the last hour, the result of voting. What is the result? What comes out when we vote? The first thing you have to understand is that the proposal you support may win or lose. If your idea wins, you don't go and sit down. You demand that the people who put that idea on the table fulfill the promise. You must demand for it. And if they don't fulfill it, punish them. Don't let anybody think they can take your vote for granted. So yes, you may win or you may lose, but it's not about winning and losing. It's not Accra, so fucking Accra, and uh, Santi Kotoko, our arc rivals, and, and, and you know, Olympics couldn't make it, you know. That did boo boo, that did boo boo, but they went down. They went down. They went down. They went down. But I know people who are still diehard Olympic supporters. They are in whatever division they are, they say, that they bubu, that they machine. Because they believe it. It won't put food on your table, but you support them. But a vote will determine what food is on your table. The second thing is that the winning proposal will shape the destiny of state. You get what you vote for. Your quality of life is determined by the result of your vote. Your quality of life is determined by the result of the vote. So you can actually vote for a party which can punish you. Yes, and, 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 and they can punish you and create hardship for you, but because you see it like supporting Olympics or Accra House of Food, you still support, although the policies are not favoring you. It's not about party colors. A nation becomes what its citizens vote for. Sometimes we pray, we say, let's pray for the nation, that God will bless the nation. No, we have to pray that the citizens will make intelligent choices. Because if the citizens don't make intelligent choices, God is not going to come and rule Ghana for us. When you vote, you have surrendered your sovereignty for somebody by power of attorney to act on your behalf. So that is Pastor Mensah Otterbill before the 2012 elections. This was a very powerful sermon that he preached. And if you go on YouTube, you find it. It's called The Vote. And credit to ICGC Media for, for that. He called it The Vote. Take these numbers down. I will read the last thing to you and then you can call me from wherever you are across the world. 055-924-2717 and 055-691-0154. 055-924-2717 and 055-691-0154. The preamble of the 1992 Constitution. That's our last document. And then we'll wrap up. The preamble of the 1992 Constitution. Please listen. Have what Dr. Mensah Otterbill said in mind and listen to this one. The preamble, the, 19, the Constitution of the Republic of Ghana, 1992, in the name of the Almighty God, we, the people of Ghana, in exercise of our natural and inalienable right to establish a framework of government which shall secure for ourselves and posterity the blessing of liberty, equality of opportunity and prosperity. The blessing of liberty, equality of opportunity and prosperity in a spirit of friendship and peace with all peoples of the world, and in solemn declaration and affirmation of our commitment to 
freedom, justice, probity, and accountability. The principle that all powers of government spring from the sovereign will of the people. Sofo spoke about sovereignty. The principle of universal adult suffrage. The rule of law. The rule of law. The protection and preservation of fundamental human rights and freedoms. Unity and stability for our nation. Unity and stability for our nation. Do hereby adopt enact and give to ourselves this constitution this is the basis and the conclusion of the whole matter why we have a constitution now the question you must ask yourself which dr otabel asked is the promises that have been made to you and the promises that are now being made to you by whichever political party and the proposals they are doing if in the past you voted for NDC, you voted for PPP, you voted for CPP, consider again whether you followed up on the promise. At least in the, in the Fourth Republic, we know NDC and MPP. Consider again whether you followed up on the promise and whether you are being a good citizen by following the dictates of this preamble of the 1992 Constitution or you are just doing party job. Think about it.